courtesy of Rad, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, we are well into the weeds with the first round, the quarterfinals of the 2020 Stanley Cup playoffs, and the Calgary Flames are battling the, the Stars, and I think it's probably been a... I would say a better battle than we thought it was going to be when we talked last week. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. Uh, Matt, before we jump in game by game, do you think the Flames are having more trouble than they thought they would with Dallas? Uh, I honestly think that the Flames are more or less beating themselves in the two games that they lost. And I think that like they're just give, making too many... Uh, mental mistakes and like just even basics of like gap control and sticks and lanes and stuff like that which caused all of their problems and, and like taking dumb penalties in game four and like just a lack of focus on the things that have made them successful in like the last two games against Winnipeg in game one one could say that's the story of the Calgary Flames a lack of focus true true well, let's get into the games. The first game was played on August 11th. The Calgary Flames opened, it's weird to say, but on the road against the Stars, which pretty much means they wore white jerseys. Um, and they ended up beating the Dallas Stars 3-2. to two. This game was probably most notable for fans because Dubé got his second and third of the playoffs, two of the Flames' three goals, and the other goal from Rasmus Anderson. Uh, Matt, why don't you start with some of your thoughts on game one? Oh, I thought that Dubé came out flying and I think he took a big step forward. He had that big hit on Dickinson and uh, could have got more than two minutes on that hit, but uh, responded with some excellent scoring chances, nearly scored on a breakaway, had that Matthew Lombardi-esque goal where he cut around the defender and just looped it in. As a name I didn't think I'd hear again, Matthew Lombardi. Yeah. At least uh, Dubé looks like he's not the handless horseman like Lombardi was. Uh, but, the f- you know... It, the Flames should do a spoof on the NFL and create a Lombardi trophy for anyone who can make that kind of move. Yeah. Well, Dubé's the first one, I think, that since Lombardi has done that. There you go, uh, he wins a Lombardi trophy. Yeah. And, uh, no, I thought that they started off well and it was very much reminiscent of the games against the Jets to finish off that series where it was just a good tactical game by the Flames and they were composed throughout it going kind of period by period here which is how I wrote my notes for this one uh, I was glad to see Dubé get rewarded for his hard work in the last round I think Dubé really came out as a a key player for the Flames against the Jets so it was nice to see that he got uh, two goals for that I thought in the first period especially, the Flames did a really good job of keeping Dallas on the perimeter and uh, away from in front of our net when they were in the zone. And I think that's a big reason why Dallas didn't score is the Flames were keeping them out of the middle of the ice in the offensive zone. Or, sorry, the Flames' defensive zone. And start to finish this period, I think the Flames played really well. They did what they needed to. They forechecked. They backchecked. They weren't giving up a lot of dumb penalties. They weren't giving up a lot of dumb giveaways. But I think things changed in the second. Dallas got better chances. They worked off the cycle really well. And they got a big shot from the point to score in this one. Um, Obviously, they took the momentum when they scored again nine seconds later. And I thought that in the second, the Flames had some really good opportunities that they missed and could have taken an even bigger lead if they would have finished there. It seemed like in this period, I don't know if you'd agree, but it just seemed like they quit skating the Flames and they paid for it in the second. Yeah, and credit to Dallas for getting the two goals. I think they were both kind of of the fluky variety. The first one hit TJ Brody in the rear end and then went to the top corner. You know, and that happens. But I think a big thing there was in the first, the Flames were keeping Dallas to the perimeter, and in the second, they let Dallas get in front of the net, so they had chances to get those fluky zones or those fluky goals in our zone. Yeah, yeah, and... Credit to them after the two goals, uh, pretty much right after the Flames resumed playing effectively and regained the lead when Rasmus Anderson just ripped one top corner. Yeah, I mean, we saw that from Raz in the first round, and we're seeing it again here. He's looking better and better all the time. 
Um, but yeah, nice goal from Raz there. And I think in the third period, the third period to me looked a lot like the first period. The Flames, I don't know what was said in the room uh, at the intermission, but they seemed to come back with a complete game. They stopped skating in the second, and I thought they looked a lot better in the third. Yeah, it was just a very composed, even keel type of performance. And the team just managed the game. Like, they didn't, like, Gaudreau's line played well defensively and helped to burn a couple of minutes here and there on their shifts and just you know everybody seemed to buy in on the details at like what I was complaining about with the fourth game and it that's why they won and they just played a complete 60 minute game if not for the two uh fluky goals Cam Talbot really should have and deserved a shutout in that game but, you know, things happen, and the, at least they managed to hel- hold on for the victory. And then they moved into Game 2 after getting the victory and ended up losing 5-4 to four in regulation in this one. Um, Alexiak breaks the tie with 40 seconds remaining, and this was a, I think this was a really rocky game for the Flames. We saw Dallas come out a lot um, quicker, a lot more determined in the first period. They battled a lot more. They were skating, hitting hard. And I'd say that Dallas probably outplayed the Flames for the whole first period. Would you agree? As soon as Dubé scored 19 seconds into the game, I went, oh, crap. Uh, because the Flames... They uh, came out hard, uh, and then uh, Dubé scored, and yeah, seemed like they just it, got it, deflated. It, yeah, it's like, oh, well, we scored, so therefore we're awesome, clearly, and we're just going to skate to an easy victory. And then they just stopped playing at that point, and Dallas just walked all over them. Yeah. No, you're right. And it's it's sort of what we see from the Flames, but usually not this early. In the regular season, we see the Flames get up, and then, you know, in the mid-second to third, usually they go, oh, we're up, we can just stop playing, and that's when they lose the game. And, and we saw that here 19 seconds in. Yeah, and then they uh, eventually, in the to the second, went down 3-1 before a bit of a fluky goal by Derek Forbort and then a goal by Corey Perry to make it 4-2. And, like, after two periods of play, like, the Flames just look completely out of it, frankly. And even that Forbort goal, I mean, it only went in because the goalie didn't see it. Yeah, like, it was just a weird, lucky bounce that went our way. And, it, you know, those do happen, but, like, 99 times out of 100, that doesn't go in. And then I thought the Flames started to sort of fight back with eight minutes left in the game until about the three-minute mark when it all just fell apart. Yeah, like, in the, the third period, like, they... I think they had a pretty good start to the period uh, up until the waved-off goal by Andrew Mangiapane. And... Then that happened. Kachuk left the game with the injury at that time. The Flames had a four-minute power play where they did nothing. Everything just kind of went blasé for them until seven and a half minutes left when Tobias Reeder scored a shorthanded goal. Yeah, when that uh, goal from 88, Mangiapane, happened, I thought to myself, well, the goal got waved off, but hey, we've got a four-minute power play. We're going to go and get it back, right? Yeah, and then they had, like, one of the worst power play efforts I've seen. Uh, two shots in four minutes. This, this and, and this is overarching in the whole series, but are you finding that the Flames are doing the thing we talked about them not doing in Winnipeg, which is trying to pass too many times on their power play? Yeah. They're the, trying oh, to pass sure. too many times. They're trying to get the right shot, and Dallas is picking it off. Well, I think a lot of it ha- is that they tend to respect the other team's goalies too much. And looking for the perfect shot instead of just creating scrambles. Like, you look at Hudobin and Bishop, the two goalies for Dallas in this series, they both looked bad, frankly. And if the Flames created a little bit of havoc in front of them, they could light them both up. And yet, they haven't been able to consistently push it and like getting pucks on net and creating havoc and it's well and i would say i think you're right about respecting the goalie but i think even without 
putting the goalie in it. They don't want to get in and do the hard work in front. In game two, I no. noticed it. Game three and game four, I noticed it. I have it in my notes for all three games. They'll get someone will have the puck in front. There's some traffic, and what do they do? They send it back to the blue line, hoping for the defenseman to get open and get a shot on the empty net. Like they just need to sometimes put it towards the net, and you know then go in and try to push it in. Mm-hmm. But we're seeing so many times when somebody's in front of the net, there's two Dallas guys there, and it's like we'll either try to put it between them or between their legs or you know up, but they're just passing it back to the defenseman as though they don't want to deal with it. Yeah, and well, that's part of the reason why Gaudreau's line, frankly, through up until game of four, were just completely invisible for most of it because they none of the three players looked interested in actually putting themselves into any dangerous areas at all i agree i would say i guess if i had to sum up game two it was a role reversal from game one the team that looked good in game one didn't look like they cared in game two and this is something that we see so often i'd say we even saw in the first round calgary Gets up by one, they get cocky, they come in, they're not ready to play game two. This I actually kind of blame on the coaching staff um, for lack of preparation. Because, uh, like, it, you can't continue year in, year out, year in, year out, having the exact same lack of preparedness every game. But like I, it, I don't think yeah. we can blame on the coaching staff for that reason. We've gone through how many coaches with this core? I know. And I think like it's, it's something a, between it's, the ears of these players. Yeah, it it's just frustrating because uh, you know you watch other teams playing their series, and you just simply don't see these issues that the Flames just continually have year in year out, and like it's mystifying how this team can continue to be so unprepared for what should be like hockey 101 type plays and they just don't even do them accurately either and like especially in game four and it's just mystifying yeah i don't disagree (laughs) with you but i just think that we've switched coaches how many times with the same core i don't think we can blame it on coaching anymore yeah I mean, if so, then they're just going to keep switching coaches with the same core and getting the same result. I think it's, yeah. I, I think, uh, to me, I think they, the team was perfectly prepped. They're ready for game one. I don't think there was any difference from the coaching staff for game two. I think it's what's between these guys' ears that's the issue, as my dad would say. What's in their head? Um, and, and I think, you know, I don't know how the coaches get around that. I think that's where you almost need to start moving personnel. Yeah. So. And I think that, frankly, if the Flames do fall to the Stars, that you're going to see structural changes with this team. I mean, you and I have talked about in the past that these guys are professionals. There's only so much you can coach these guys at, right? I mean, there's only yeah. so much that a coach can prepare them or a coach can get them ready or, you know, things like that. These guys are the best in the world. And to me, if they're not mentally checked in and ready to go, I don't know how much the coach can change that or fix that. Yeah. Well, like, uh, I've even said that, like, getting a guy like a Daryl Sutter, not necessarily him, but where he, he challenges the players, and if they don't respond, well, then you change those players we've, out. Yeah, for, but, but we've had those oh, coaches that have challenged the players. The issue is they haven't changed the players. I know. Right? Well, that's They've where, been challenged where by, I, Yeah, I think, I think yeah. that Peters came in and challenged guys at the beginning, and then they tuned him out. So I, I think it's a combination of things. You have to have that coach is going to challenge them, but you also have to move the guys that aren't listening. And I think that's the issue we have here is they're just they're stuck with this core and they're trying to find the coach that will work with this core, which I don't think you're going to find. No. I think it's, yeah. I think we've proven it's not a coaching issue. Mm-hmm. But let's get on to game three. Game three, uh, the Calgary Flames came out a little bit harder. Um, the Flames took the lead of the series in Game 3, ended up winning 2 nothing. got a shutout here. Um, we had some some differences. Well, one question going into this on the back-to-back was who would start for the Flames. Talbot started again, and we had two lineup changes. Quine was in for Kachuk, and uh, Ronaldo was in for Jankowski. 
And because of that, the second line looked different than it had before. We had Mangiapani and Tobias Reeder promoted to line number two with Michael Backlund. Matt, if you were looking at a roster at the beginning of the season and your second line was Andrew Mangiapani, Michael Backlund, and Tobias Reeder, is that a team you think would have much success? Not really, no. But, you know, you have to go with the guys that you got and... To be fair to Japani and uh, Reader, especially, uh, they've both up and well, not Japani in game four, but uh, Reader has really stepped up his game in the postseason. For sure. And I'm not saying they're not good players, but I always look at a team in three ways. I look at a top six, a middle six, and a bottom six. There's guys that you say, okay, these guys could be line one, two. There's guys where you say these guys could be line three, four, and, or two, three, and then there's guys three, four. And I don't look at Tobias Reeder as my middle six guy. I look at him as my bottom six guy. Yeah. But he's looking good. Yeah. Well, it's one of those things that... For a guy who this time it, last it, year didn't have a job, he's really... He's come come a long way. Yeah. I'd like him back, frankly. He's been rather effective in his role. For but, what he uh, will cost, I don't see why they wouldn't. Yeah. But... Um, no, and the Flames uh, in this game, it, they controlled the play for most of the first period. I thought they were the better team after one. Uh, then they got the early goal shorthanded by Michael Backlund, a lucky bounce, and they kind of just stopped skating at that point and ended up getting outshot 16-4 to by the Stars. And the third period wasn't much different. And Even in the second period, the Flames went over ten and a half minutes without a shot at the end of that period. Yeah, like the, first, uh, the fourth shot was the goal, and then they didn't get another shot the rest and of the Dallas period. And Dallas did a really good job, to their credit, of doing what we did in game one and keep making it hard for us to enter their zone. And when we did get in, not letting us get near the blue paint. Yeah, and that's... A matter of the team not willing to sacrifice the body to get to the dirty areas. Um, 13 of 18 Flames skaters blocked shots in this game. Then there were a lot of Dallas shots. You mentioned 35 of them. And I thought the big reason the Flames lost here was that first line still didn't look good enough. And they almost seemed like they were three guys who'd never played together. Like they're, they didn't seem to know where each other were on the ice. They were doing dumb things. It looked like a line that had been thrown together for the first time. And I don't know if it was just three talented guys who are, were going out there trying to say, I'm going to take this into my own hands and do it. But you know, those guys, if they don't come alive and do better, the flames, even if they win the series, they're not going to go much further. No. Cause it, by all likelihood, Vegas should end Chicago. They're up 3-1 in the series. I don't really see Chicago coming back and winning that. So Calgary, if they do advance, are going to be facing uh, the Vegas Golden Knights. And at the if the Flames continue to play like they are, it's going to be a four-game series for Vegas. Yeah, especially if you've got no Kachuk. I mean, that really that if that first line's not producing, that really limits your uh, scoring pool. Yeah, and like it, it's just the lack of effort, I think, by a lot of players on the team. Is it fair to say in Game 3 that uh, the Flames won because of Talbot? Oh, he stole the show. And you need that, everyone. You know, like you in order yeah. to win in the postseason, like you need your goalie to give, steal you one. And he nearly did in Game th 4 as well. well yeah, I think that he, you need him to steal you one, but the Flames have been relying on him to steal the game too much. Yeah. And I mean, you, and and it's the same story last year with Smith. Like Smith did an absolutely amazing job in the postseason to keep it from the Flames from getting absolutely embarrassed in each of the games. But there's only so much that one guy can do. Well, let's talk about that game four that you mentioned. In game four, there was over a hundred shots in this game. Sixty-two from the Stars, forty from the Flames. The Calgary Flames end up losing five to four in overtime in this game, and. Matt, do you think it would be fair to say the scoreboard probably doesn't tell the whole story here? The Flames lost, but I thought both, I thought this was the most entertaining game of the, the series, and I thought probably the best Calgary Flames game of the series. I'm going to give a caveat uh, on that. Up until Sam Bennett scored his first goal of the game uh, four minutes into the second period, 
I thought that was the best Flames effort up until that point that I've seen possibly all season. And then they stopped playing. And entirely. And the wheels fell off the wagon. Dallas took over the game right from then on in. And uh, in the second and third period, or the third period in overtime, they had 33 shots. They had 18 in the second period. Like, it just, it was embarrassingly bad. And, like, the Flames had, they had the game. All they had to do was just keep skating and doing just fundamental hockey. Keep basics. skating and also staying out of the box. What killed us here was the number of penalties yeah. we took. Yeah, like, just the stupid amount of penalties like and it, you know that like especially when elias lindholm got that cross-checking penalty in the first period and how light of a hit that was to draw the penalty it's like you should be remembering not to touch anybody because the refs obviously are going to be calling penalties left right and center on you if you give them the opportunity and they took five penalties in a row. What do you expect? Well, and this goes back to what I was saying earlier about this being between the guys' ears, right? You can't – there's only so much a coach can tell them, but there's something going on mentally with these guys where they're not seeing that. They're not going, okay, they're calling this game differently than our last one. Let's adjust our play so we don't end up in the box so much. Yeah, and, like, to their credit, they did get that shorthanded goal in the third period to give them the lead. But – they didn't respond at all to their good fortune and like, okay, we killed off that penalty. Let's go and, you know, try to reset things and burn the clock. Instead, like a minute and a half after that, Sean Monahan took a penalty, or no, it was five minutes later. Uh, Sean Monahan took a high sticking penalty. And then like two minutes after that, Backlund took one and, like by that time like Dallas is just throwing everything at the net and like you just can't do that like the buy-in defensively from this team like they're not even playing just basic fundamental hockey where you just your forwards collapse in to get their sticks in the lanes and prevent high danger chances in front of the net it was a tire fire I thought the Flames came out early looking really good. I thought they had the momentum to start, but then as soon as Dallas got on their power play, that momentum shifted, um, which if that hadn't happened, as we talked about, I think the Flames would have looked better. And the top line, got to give them credit, that uh, Monty, Johnny, and um, Lindholm line, I thought looked a lot better today than they have all series. You mentioned the tires coming off after the Bennett goal. I really noticed it in the third. I thought that Calgary got hemmed in their own zone a lot in the third, and that's why there were so many shots on net. Calgary just couldn't figure out how to clear the puck out of their own out of their own end. Yeah, and like it's just even basics, and like say like with Lindholm, what happened just prior to them tying the the game up? He had time and space where he could have done one of three things. He could have held on to the puck and, like, let the Stars players, like, come and get him to get the puck and fight to burn the clock off because there was only 10, 12, 15 seconds left. He could have rimmed it around the other side and there was no defender at the point on the near side. And instead he flings it around haphazardly or... Or he could have just turned and flipped the puck out of the air through the neutral zone. But instead he rims it around the boards where where there were players, and the puck ends up in the net. It seems and, like the guys like, are just haphazardly throwing the puck towards the neutral zone. Yeah, like, it, it's all well and good to try and get the puck out. That's what you're supposed to do. But you also have to think, like, time and place and, like react better and be more aware and it, it's just like what happened with the overtime winner brody or one of the players broke their stick dube and uh or brody did and dube handed the stick off to him and forboard has the puck well instead of just clearing even if you take the icing who cares 
you know, you, you're fresh on the ice anyway. Take the icing so that way everybody has a stick. But instead he makes a fancy pass to his the pe- defense partner. It gets turned over and the puck gets in the net. All because of a player missing a stick. Well, you know, just the lack of awareness of, oh, one of our players broke a stick. Let's not have that situation. And... You know, like, it's just fundamental hockey, and the Flames just continually, year in, year out, just even basics can't seem to get one game where they're just doing things correctly. Like, it, and it, like they could it honestly, if they had played just reasonably well, today we should be talking about how the Flames swept the Dallas Stars. Yeah, or at least drop 3-1. to one. Yeah, and, like, there's no reason why this series should be tied. Like, no, Dallas I, I, played, you know, the Flames gave two games away to the Stars, and now the Stars have a little bit of momentum, and some of their guys are actually going, and it could very well be that they'll end up c- carrying that forward. But it's just so frustrating, because, like, this team was in a good place to put the boots to the stars and just, you know, carry on into the the next round. Yeah. But instead they beat themselves. And like, it, it's so frustrating seeing this team. Like it, it would be fine if this was not like the same exact story that we've seen for the last five years, six years. <laughs> but that, just, but that the, goes back to, I think the discussion we had earlier about, is this a coaching issue or is this with the players on the ice? We've seen the same problem yeah. with multiple coaching staffs. Yeah. Oh, I know. And, like, that's why at this point, like, uh, you know, if the Flames do carry on and lose to Dallas, or even if they win but get thumped by Vegas in the next round, I, I think that they have to make major structural changes to this team to, you know, and, like, take guys that are actually showing that they – care uh, regularly um like the kachucks the manjapanes the dubes the bennett's the luchichas keep those guys and the invisibles get rid of them yeah well i, I think i have enough faith in true living that he'll make the right moves if when the, when it comes to that time how about you yeah yeah well honestly one of the things that i've been somewhat frustrated with is it, it's been a lingering thing in the back of my mind it is it has to do with Sam Bennett and he does have skill and like when it comes time for the playoffs he's more engaged but he's also getting a better opportunity and he works better as a center in his first season he was a center and he played effectively and you know when you're playing with just basically the roster filler guys it's hard when you have nobody to pass to or who can pass it to you and i think that like his frustration with the team which has been apparent at times like i think that the flames need to get you know give him the second line center spot next year and let him run with it and you know one way or the other just give it to him and, uh, you know, like, he has shown when he's given and put in a good spot that he can run with it. But the Flames never give him any runway or leeway. They just, oh, well, you had a bad shift, so you get dumped on the fourth line. And, you know, like, uh, if I was an opposing general manager, like, Bennett would be, like, the number one buy low candidate of any player in the NHL that I'd be targeting. And, and I think if we yeah. make some moves up in the top six, you'll see more room made for Bennett because of that. Yeah, and I like I think that he has a, a high degree of give a crap when the games matter, and I think that's lacking with like uh, frankly guys like Monahan and Gaudreau. You know, like they're 
excellently talented players, but they don't seem to have that gear. And, you know, they might be able to, you know, like today was a better game, but they don't seem to have that upper gear of in playoff intensity to them where guys Here's my other guys on those do. Two. We see those two when they want to be good, they can be good. I think they both need to be on a line where their two line mates are upping the um upping the intensity and right and we've seen Lindholm look good and bad during this series, but Johnny and Monty together, they both don't care and I think it's easy for them to sort of feed off that energy. And I think if you were to replace let's just say one of them with someone who cared more, I think the one that's remaining you'd see that intensity jump up. If you've got Lindholm and the other guy on that first line, both intense, I think Sean and Johnny can do it. They're just on a line where you've got two Eeyores. Yeah, I can agree with that. And, like, you can have guys like that in your roster. like uh, But not the your Penguin, top line guys. Yeah, the Penguins, they had Phil Kessel. And, the, you know, he did an excellent job on the second line because he wasn't the main guy, and he could just do his thing. And, you know, but when he was the guy with Toronto, it, it was bad. It, when he was the guy with Boston, it was bad. And Well, and I, I mean, you it, and I have had a lot of discussions over the years about Michael Backlund, and he's looked good, he's looked bad, and ever since he started playing with Kachuk, I mean, we've seen different iterations of that Kachuk line. I think he's one of those guys, too, that if his line is rising the occasion, Backlund will rise the occasion with them. Yeah, well, you look at... Uh, today, like, Manjapane was off. It was quite clear that, like, I think that he he was hurt or something because he did not look himself. But that line today was completely invisible the entire game. Because, like, Tobias Reeder is a good defensive player, but he's not an intense guy. He's just a good penalty killer. And I, I know the coaches didn't want to break up that Lucic Bennett Dubé line, but to me, I would have been putting Dubé up on the second line. Like if I'm looking at who's producing, Dubé's the guy I'd want to put in one of those top six offensive spots. Yeah, and it's you don't it, want to put Mangiapane yeah. on the checking line with Lucic Bennett. He's not going to do well there. You could put Ronaldo up there and move Mangiapane down to four, but I just. I mean, I know that Tobias Reader's looking good. I'd almost do my second line as Dubé, Backlund, Reader at this point and find somewhere else from Manjapani. Yeah. Actually, I have an odd, a very odd idea for what I would do. You're going to put one of the defensemen up front, aren't you? No, no, actually. I'm going to go completely off the board, and I would say put Buddy Robinson on the first line. Why? He's big, he's fast, and he can hit. And he has chemistry with Gaudreau, because they played together for years. And you move Lindholm down to the second line. I think you demoralize your team, though, if you bring in a guy who hasn't played and put him on the first. I think before that, I'd put a guy like Sam Bennett in Lindholm's spot and reward him for what he's doing. Well, I'm just trying to figure out any way, really, of shaking up the top six, because, you know, and th that's about the only other option that I can think of that would be out of the box anyway. And I mean, if you want these guys to respect the coach, I don't think you're going to gain respect by bringing in a guy who hasn't played at all and put him on the first line. Yeah, well, how would you say? To me, that would be more of a kick in the pants to everybody that we think so little of how well you've been playing that we're going to take this guy who's not, you know, just, and stick him on the first line because, you know, and uh, as a motivational message to wake up. I and, think you could get Buddy yeah. Robinson there, but you don't start a game with him on line one. You start a game with him, yeah. say, in Ronaldo's spot, and if he looks good, you promote him up the lineup. But I think coming out yeah. for game five with Buddy Robinson slotted on the first line is a great way to lose this team. You bring him in, and then you let him work his way up the lineup. Yeah. Oh, I think that the Flames need to have a few messages sent, you know, of, like, get your head out of your posterior. <laughs> and, it'll, it'll come. You know, yeah. Yeah. I, I think, uh, and I think, you know, we're being hard on the team, and they deserve it, but I think we also have to remember how much hockey these guys have played. Oh, I know. And, like, uh, of course, like, every team 
But like you were saying today, dealing. Mangiapane hasn't didn't show up, and I would agree with you. These guys haven't played hockey since March. Yeah, no, a lot of them. Uh, I know. Out, with him specifically, yeah, with him specifically, I think he might have got hurt because uh, he just. With him, it seemed like something was off with how he was playing. It, like it wasn't. It was more than like just. Uh, having a bad game. And with the, like... with the schedule in mind, I mean, Cam Talbot took 62 shots on net today. Even if we were to win a game like that, if we were to won in overtime, is there concern about the number, that number of shots getting in the net? Like, that's a crazy number of shots to let to get by you. I think that tells us we need to be looking at how we're playing inside our blue line and work on getting that puck out of our own end. Yeah, well, you know... We're seeing the Flames can score. I think they've got the offensive part down, and the part that's killing them is the play in their own end. Yeah, and that's, like, where I was uh, talking about just, like, basics for this team of basic defensive coverage and getting your sticks in lanes and making it tough on the opposition to work through and fight through to get the ice and and like the flames today were just like here's wide open shots in the slot have fun but see i don't even think that to me i don't think they're missing the basics what i think they're doing is they're doing the same thing too many times the calgary flames are starting to be the one trick pony where teams can easily scout them and know what they're going to do and it's almost like they have one or two or three set plays that they just go to over and over and over again and yeah. I don't know if it's a coaching issue. I don't know what it is, but I think the Flames need to think the game better. And, like, even today, when they were trying to clear the puck, they did the same thing over and over, so the defensemen know exactly where to stand. Fours know exactly where to stand for Dallas. Like, you've got to yeah. read read the ice and react better. Mm-hmm. We've got guys that are capable of doing the work. I just think that it's the, the Flames need to think on their feet more. And yeah. even in the offensive zone, I mean, we're seeing, as I mentioned to you earlier, we're seeing so many times the Flames are going towards the net, passing back to the blue line. Dallas is starting to get smart with that. They're putting one guy back, so when we pass back to the blue line, they can try to intercept it. Like, we're just doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over again, and we're making it easier for teams to read us. Yeah. And... Even though Dallas claimed before the 2 nothing shutout, they figured out Cam Talbot and all his weaknesses. Maybe they did by game four, but like, yeah, we're just the Flames aren't going to get further if they're if they can only do one thing in each zone. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I think they looked good against Winnipeg with is every team or every line on this team seemed to do something a little bit different against Winnipeg. Every line seemed to have its own identity and play a little bit differently. And now it just feels like the team's just playing the game, if that makes sense. It sort of reminds yeah. me of you know when I was in minor hockey. We didn't get into a lot of strategy and stuff. It was go out there and do what you think is right. And it feels like the team's not even doing that. It's just, hey, go out and do this thing that we worked on at practice yesterday. And that's all they're doing is the same, the same, you know, clearing drill or whatever. They need yeah. to just go with their gut and say, okay, let's look around. Let's see where the players are. Let's react accordingly. Yeah. And like that, you know, like I, I've been watching a few of the other series and. Like, you just see other teams, like, say the New York Islanders, like, they're not an exceptionally different team from the Flames, where they have a couple of good upper-end forwards and just a lot of decent NHLers, and yet, like, their just attention to detail and their strategies... Like and they're just running roughshod yeah. over the Washington Capitals. The Islanders are detail oriented and they're they're changing it up so that the Caps can't figure them out. Mm-hmm. It's just very frustrating this team. Well, we'll see if they can bounce back in Game Five and Six. We know this is at least a fi- uh, six game series now. But my question to you, Matt, is if we don't see Matthew Kachuk back and if the first line keeps playing like they have, do the Flames really have any shot at winning this thing? <sighs> Honestly, based on how games two, three, and four have gone, I would be frankly shocked if they won this series. Uh, um, and I thought that, like after game three against Colorado last year, uh, uh, e- even though like at the time we were only down two one, I'm like, yeah, there's no way. And I think that the Flames have allowed the Stars to wake up uh, mm-hmm. with 
just their absolutely atrocious defense and I think once again the Flames are just beating themselves and honestly I think this is over in six and I think that they're gonna yeah I, this was I the don't... same conversation you and I had last year I was gonna say this time last year but it wasn't this time it was playoff time in like May but Johnny Goudreau, Sean Monahan didn't show up. Lindholm was a warrior last year, and he was trying to carry that whole line. And the Flames were looking to their depth to win the series. And you need depth to help you win, but your first line and even your second line guys need to do the hard work. And, you know, we're not we're not seeing that. I mean, if Tobias Reeder is our best player, you're not going to win the Stanley Cup. Oh, God, no. Like, And that's no slight to Reeder or Bennett or Dubé. But, like, if... The, you know, how would you say, like, when Pittsburgh won the Cup uh, in Jake Gensel's rookie year, like, Gensel, he contributed quite a bit as a depth player in much the same role that Dylan Dubé's playing. And that's awesome. But they still had Crosby, Malkin, and Kessel mm. do lifting the load. I mean, it, yeah, and, like you said, if Dubé, Bennett, and Reeder are, become our second line and they're doing all the work... We're in trouble. Yeah, and, like, you just can't rely on that. Like, it, it's... It's good they can fill in when we need the help, but you can't rely on your depth guys. Your top guys need to get going, and the depth guys need to fill in where they're where they're not. Well, like, even uh, to criticize him before he got hurt, like, Matthew Kachuk has been very poor as a performer in the playoffs Poor as in well. what sense? In terms of his offensive production? Yeah, uh, he only, I think, has like five points but or something like that. But I think like he's that. been bringing a lot more to the team. He's been bringing a yeah. lot of energy. Oh, for sure. Yeah, you know, like he's been drawing penalties and the Flames have been scoring on them, so that, that's good. But, like, he hasn't brought enough either. And, like, when you have basic... Like, the Flames have four primary offensive forwards, Lindholm, Monahan, Gaudreau, and Kachuk. If you only have one of those guys actually showing up, you know, like... I think we should be able to have Kachuk do what he's doing and then have other people scoring on those power plays. But the thing is, Kachuk has been, I think, one of the hardest working flames when he's been in the lineup, and the rest of the guys aren't rising that occasion. Mm -hmm. The one thing I will, and I've been trying to deflect some of the coaching criticism this show, as, you, as you've heard. Um, the one thing I will criticize Jeff Ward for is I think he's given his – top line of Goudreau, Monaghan, and Lindholm too much rope. I think that they, yeah. you know, they were the top line. They deserved probably to be together at the beginning, but I think now from what we're seeing, they looked better in this game. And I think you put them, you start them together in game five, sort of like you were saying with Buddy Robinson, though. You start them together in game five with the caveat that, guys, you looked better. Keep that up, or we're making some line changes. Yeah. And I think this, oh. is, this has been a, a Calgary thing for a while, but I think even with Jeff Ward, we ride that top line too much. Yeah, and like it to me, like uh, uh, with how this team is set up currently, like uh, it's almost like I would prefer this team to take if, but like, assuming they lose either to Dallas or they get thumped by Vegas, because I, I at this point, unless they change drastically, I don't see them winning more than a game against Vegas, but, um, like, th I think that they need to just take a step back and even, like, organizationally uh, and retool a bit and, you know, move on from certain players. You know, we have a bunch of good young guys coming up. But until that time, you have to find a way to do what you can with what we've got. Yeah, and I think, like, just swapping out some deck chairs and allowing guys like Manjapane, Bennett, and Dubé more of an opportunity full-time. And, like, yeah, the Flames will probably miss the playoffs next year if they do that. But I think that that would still be a better... Well, let's look ahead to that in the offseason. Let's talk about what they can yeah. do with this roster right now because you can't make those moves until November. So, I mean... Oh, I know. You know, and we don't want to say, well, we're just going to be lambs to slaughter and figure it out later. What could they do with the players they have now in August to try and revitalize things? And and I don't disagree with you. I just don't think now is the time to have that discussion. Yeah, true I, enough. I think, you know, once Kachuk comes back, the first thing I would do, I would switch him and Goudreau around. I think Kachuk, Monaghan, Lindholm bring some 
grit to that first line. I think Chucky's going to be the guy that can go into the corners, get that puck out, pass it to the other two, and let them do the magic in front of the net. I think mm-hmm. putting Goudreau on the second line with Backlund and Reader, or Backlund and Mangiapane, depending on how you want to look at that, I think is going to make Johnny skate a little bit more. Yeah. And I think you get a setup man for Johnny then in Michael Backlund. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, you know, just looking at the players we have, and like you said, shuffling deck chairs, there's only so many ways we can shuffle this roster around that makes sense in its current iteration. Yeah. The other thing I would not be surprised to see the Flames do is uh, swap Brody and Anderson on the back end. I think Anderson's playing so well, I think he deserves... Uh, um, actually, I'm going to go one step further. I think that they should swap the Han- Hannafin-Anderson pairing with the Giordano and Brody pairing. You think that the the magic's in the pairing? Uh, uh, no, I think that Giordano's been playing poorly and needs to start being sheltered. But I, but I'm thinking if you put him with Raz, you might get a different look there that might start him up. Uh, it seems like he and Brody are too comfortable together. Well, honestly, I think that uh, Giordano is just looking a little slower skating wise out there, and I think that's the problem. So that's which is why which I've... is fine. He can be, but I think yeah. I mean, I I don't disagree with you, but. Moving him to second pair, he's still going to be slow, and Brody's not the fastest guy either. I think if you put a younger guy like Raz with him, Raz can make up for some of the lost speed there. Mm -hmm. If you tell Gio you're going to be the stay-at-home guy, you get to the blue line when you can. Raz will rush into the zone. He'll stay a little bit higher up. He'll be more the offensive guy. I think you can make it work. Um, But you... I just I know what you're saying about Gio, and I don't think you necessarily need to. He needs to be getting as many minutes as he has, but I'm not convinced Noah Hannafin's ready for more minutes either. Well, I thought he had a really good game in Game Four. I thought I, I thought he had it. a good game, but I don't know that giving him more minutes is going to help him at this point. Yeah, I think in a lot of ways he's looked better since he's come to Calgary, and he hasn't been the guy on the blue line. Yeah. Oh. It's in, It has been interesting to see the Henderson pairing um, a, a, as they've developed during this postseason because they've both looked as good, I think, as they have all season. And I'm hoping that'll continue into next year. Yeah, and honestly, I think that that's your first pairing next year. Yeah, we'll we'll see what happens with moves and guys coming in. I think it could be, but I also think this coaching staff is not going to be quick to demote Giordano. Um, one one concern I had today when our goalie is taking you know sixty shots in this game, thirty plus last game. Are you worried about Talbot getting hurt? Oh, of course. Or getting um, very fatigued. Like I think if we lose Talbot, we're out. I don't think that Riddick is going to be our savior like Talbot has. Well, well, honestly, if the Flames don't figure out a way of preventing the Stars from just basically running roughshod over us in our defensive zone, I think we're out regardless of who's in that. So, like, it's one of those things that, like, the team needs to figure out a way to sort everything out Here, um, here's a scenario for you if you're the coach flames lose game five on tuesday let's say that they get 30 or more shots just for the sake of argument against going into game six would you change your goalie would you say you know what we're probably out any i mean you don't say it to the team but you know what? we're probably out of this thing anyways let's give cam a rest and see what dave can do or do you just ride talbot to the end uh, if the Flames play poorly again for the fourth straight game, then I, y- you have to look for any way to shake the team up, and I think switching the goalie, because what's the difference? Uh, you know, like if you're going to play lousy and you lose, well, you're going to play lousy and you lose for, for the next guy. It would it just mean matter. that we'd lose 8-2 to two instead of 4-2. to two. Yeah, so like at that point, like who cares? Like, you know. Uh, you need something to try and wake the team up. And if that gives you a spark and it works and you push it to seven, then awesome. But Well, knowing how this team sort of has been all season, as we talked about, they get too cocky and they stop playing. And I'm wondering if there's a good portion of this team, especially the forwards, they're saying, you know what? 
Cam, we can ride Cam. We don't need to work as hard. I mean, they're not obviously saying that out loud, but I think that might be sort of what's going on in the head is Cam's got it. We can just go out there and do whatever, and Cam will keep us in this game. And I wonder if you throw David in, if they say, you know what, guys? We'll see what Dave does, but you're going to need to work a lot harder to keep pucks away from him. Yeah. And if you don't, well, you'll get what you deserve. So it'll be interesting to see what happens there. We have game uh, two or game five coming up on Tuesday, the 18th at obviously Edmonton time to be determined. And we know of a game six, which will be Thursday time to be determined. So it's funny when Matt and I were recording last week and they just put the schedule up, they said those games were going to be at midnight. If you remember the schedule said uh, midnight uh, yeah. games. And I said, that can't be right, Matt, but we'll, we'll see when they are. I guess it depends on what other series are done. I really don't want it to be a, a noon game again. Uh, oh, uh, they finally posted it. Uh, game uh, five will be at 3.30 our time. Um, and on Thursday, it's still to be determined. To be determined. So, so we will be in the afternoon again at 3.30. So g- go to work early that day, get off a little bit early and watch the game. Um I don't know why we're having so many games at half past the hour, 8.30, 3.30. Like, what happened to the good old regular season where we just start at 7? Yeah, well, I guess it has, must have to do with the ice plant and making sure everything's done and having that extra little bit of time. Probably to... cleaning and sanitizing the rooms and that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm, uh, I, I don't know if you noticed it today, but did you watch on TV? Yeah. Cuthbert and DeBrusque are starting to look worn down. Oh, it's hard. You know, like they, they were looking very chipper in the first uh, qualifier games. And now they're looking like they're just getting sick of calling hockey. Yeah. It's like, I want to go outside. <laughs> you know, well, like and just... the emotion you get into a game, you know, it, it's, there's a lot of emotion there and having to do it over and over again for various teams. It's, it's a lot. Yeah. Like you'd almost have thought that they would have had, a couple of crews just to, you know, like like one for the morning game and one for the evening type of thing. Yeah, or yeah, or just you're you're working with these teams and you're working with these other teams, and when the teams are playing against each other, we'll pick which crew we want to use. But yeah, it's it's kind of it's starting to get noticeable in their call. I found. I mean, yeah. I give them a lot of credit for doing what they're doing, but it's getting noticeable. Yeah. Well, it, I think it would be hard for anybody to... For sure. Um, looking ahead to game five and six, obviously we can't blow up the roster. We can't make roster moves. We could bring Buddy Robinson in. That's about all we could do. But what do the Flames have to do to to win this series now? It's a best two out of three at this point. Well, if they're going to win, they have to play smart defensively. Like, Go review the game tapes from game one and just do that. Like, they they know how to. Like, they did it for game three and four last series. They've shown us they can do it. Yeah, like, it's not some foreign language that they've never heard before. Like, they literally just did it earlier in the week. So, you know, they, it's it shouldn't be this hard and like frankly if they had even played a little bit like that for game two and four we're already talking about vegas right now do you think the flames can still come back at this point (sighs) frankly i know you always like to use the anything's possible line but looking at this realistically frankly dug themselves in too big a hole i have yet to see this team develop a backbone and to actually elevate their game when it actually matters. And, you know, um, this will be, uh, the next two games for sure will be showing you what the character of these players is. And, you know, like, like if they don't win this series then I think you have final verdicts on a whole bunch of players. And sure, and we, we've been talking about that since Christmas. Yeah, and we'll see. Uh, you know, it, it, this is f- definitely a put-up-or-shut-up time. And, you know, like, there is no excuses. 
there is no excuse to be tied right now. Like, the the Stars are not that good. Uh, they should be up 3-1 at a minimum, but, you know. I think yeah. right now the Flames are on a path to slow death. They're either going to... I mean, all the games this, ser- this round have been c- close, and I think that we're going to see them put in a lot of effort and not get rewarded for it. And I think they're out... I don't think they beat Dallas. And if they do by some miracle, they don't get past Vegas. Like, I think we're just on a slow path to death at this point. Yeah. Like, the only difference, like, if they do pe- beat the Stars, like, I really just don't see any path with us at this point with how they're playing. Like, it, it would be different if Goudreau's line was actually contributing and, you know, like, Kachuk was healthy and all that. The Flames might stand a chance against the, the Golden Knights because I don't think they're that good either. But we haven't seen that. Well, I said, from what we've seen, they'll they'll probably come out against the Golden Knights, play one good game. Yeah, then, they, then they'd, they'd probably game win two. game one. Yeah, they'd probably win game one and then get absolutely ran over the rest of the way. I think they'd get run over in game two. And like we saw against Dallas, I don't think they'd ever fully recover. Like, I think... This is probably bad to say as a Flames fan. I almost kind of want them to just get put out of their misery by Dallas. Like, I think it's going to be more miserable watching them try to beat Vegas. And at least with Dallas, we're getting some games that are fun to watch and pretty close. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, it, it kind of reminds... I know I probably shouldn't say this that, but... Playoffs, this playoffs reminds me a little bit of, like, the Vancouver's year in 2014. Reminds me of every uh, playoff we've had since, like, 2010. Well, like, even 2014-2015, uh, where, like, they beat Vancouver, and it, then they meet, met a team that actually had their stuff together. <laughs> and, you know, in the Ducks, and, yeah, that was over quick. And, like, I think that... Like, if the Flames do get past the the Stars, like, unless they can el- find a way to elevate their game again, like, I think it's they're going to just get absolutely trashed. And, you know, it's frustrating. And they frustrating. haven't shown us they have that ability. No, and, like, the thing is, is that talent, the, the frustrating, the absolutely frustrating paper. part is they're probably right there with Colorado for the the best talented team in the Western Conference and probably one of the three or four best in the entire NHL. But, you know, can they show up? And it's not seeming that they actually have it in them. Yeah, and I mean, we'll talk about off-season changes once we get there. But, um, you know, I just... Right now, I can't see, and there's always, as you like to say, it could happen. Yeah, it could for sure. But from what we've seen from the Flames in the qualifying round and this round, I don't think they've got the the gas left in them in order to you know to win this round and win next round. I think, like I said, I'd almost rather they just lose to Dallas and be done with it. And I think the reason I say that is not only is it going to be frustrating to watch them against Vegas, but I think it sets a message. I think. If you make it to round two, you could have the coaching staff and the GM say, well, we're not going to make changes because we made it further than we did last year, and we made it to round two. And you might not see them make some of the changes they want because of that. I think if they lose in round one again, you can't say that we're any better than last year. We weren't the Western Conference champs. We- no, and at least last year, you could say, well, hey, look at Colorado. They have McKinnon. Yeah. And they have McCarr. And they have L- Landis Cog. But even then, our they guys have didn't the goalie. show up. I know, but you look at Dallas. Who the heck do they have? Like Corey Perry. You know, like Tyler Sagan is not good anymore. Jamie Ben is not better anymore. Pavelski's thirty six or aging whatever. Team. Yeah. You know, like they're not a good team, and like there is absolutely no excuse to lose to this team. It, you know, like if you fall on your face against this team, then. Your team needs to get majorly well, that's, shaken that's up. That's where I was going with it. Is if we can't beat Dallas and we're out in the first round again, um, you know, I think there's no denying this team has to be shaken up. I think if they make it past Dallas and they lose to Vegas, someone could say, "Well, we did better than last year. We made it to the second round. Let's not change the core." I think it's if you can't beat Dallas in the first round, change has to be made for sure. So I, I almost. It's bad to say, but I hope they're out this round because it sends the message they need if they're going to be out. Yeah, 
Like, if they can actually go toe-to-toe with Vegas and actually possibly beat the Knights, if then, they can... hey, awesome. You know, great. Awesome. But To me, though, in order for them to do that, they have to pull their socks up and win the next two. Yeah. And I... decisively, you like they did in three go... and four if, against the if Jets. If you go to game like... seven... I'm not convinced that they're that they're any better because obviously we let Dallas back in. I think they've got to pull their socks up, like you said, play like we did in those two games, the back to backs against the Jets, and even Game Four against the Jets. Um, but I would say, actually, Game Three, Four against the Jets are the ones they want to play like. But I think they need to come out. They need to just roll over Dallas on Tuesday, roll over Dallas Thursday. Then maybe there's some thought that okay, these guys can do it. But if we see the same lackadaisical play, even if they win. Because they were the least bad team, that's not going to get you any further. No. And, like, guys like Gaudreau and Monaghan start... And you saw that a little bit in overtime with Gaudreau. Start to, you know, take over games. and. But then you, you know, do that like, right from puck drop. Yeah. And we'll see. I you mean, know, and, Matt, and, you've, and the, you've heard me the say thing it is, earlier... In the season, the th- in the series, do you or in the season, do you think that Sean Monahan's a second line center? It, he is a first line center, as long as you have proper wingers. Like, how would you say he is? He the player that he's always reminded me a lot of is Patrick Marlowe. just a guy that's there. He, you can expect thirty goals from him. He'll do his job. But don't expect him to carry the team. And you need wingers with him in order to have him be successful. Or shift him over to the wing. And, like, his offensive skill and talent, he is that good. But his overall game is, similar to Marlowe, is not that good. And I think that, like, if he's your main guy you're kind of not in a good spot. And, like, it, it it's bad to say, but, like, having Gaudreau as his right-hand man, like, that's hard because, you know, he, too, needs to be on a line where he's not the guy. Like, he needs to be the shifty guy that you don't really pay any attention to, and he gets the, you know, if he's driving the line... All of a sudden, it, he's in front of the net getting a pass and putting it in. Yeah, or making that good pass. And, you know, like, he need, Frankly, like, he needs more of a... Um... A dry... Like, a Lindholm-type center where, like, a more primary intense guy uh, as the center and, like, a right winger that can carry the play as well. And, you know, like, it's just... Yeah, like it's not a Monahan is not a good fit structurally with Gaudreau because, yeah, you know, even put there because they're the best we've got, quote unquote. But yeah, I think that those two together, as I mentioned earlier, I think that one drags the other down, and that's why we're not seeing the production we need. Yeah, well, like in a hypothetical, and I'm just gonna say this: if you get Taylor Hall, right, and you know, like there's been rumors, like the Flames did nearly get him instead of Arizona. Uh, if you throw him with Monahan and right winger guy, that would be a more proper m- mix than what Gaudreau would bring to that line. Because Hall can play that physical game and create space. And I think you could say Monahan. the same of either of those guys, though. You could put, say, Hall, Lindholm, or Hall Kachuk and Gaudreau and still get better production. Yeah, it's just that. that combo needs to be broken up at some point and and i think one of the big issues there is we don't have a number two center to to try out there i mean you could put lindholm back at center but back i I would i would actually what i would love to see next year is uh the second line being matthew kachuk sam bennett and dylan dubé back becomes an expensive number three then that's fine that's fine you know, yeah, you you know, like you can throw Manjapani with Lucic and Backlund. That's a good third line. Yeah, or you know. I mean, and you may also have to look at though at that point in a flat cap era is if he's going to be number three, is there more value in moving him? Yeah, 
True enough. Not that I want to see him gone, but if you're paying him five and a half to be your third center, I think the team might have to say, yeah, he's good, but could we get somebody cheaper? And would moving him, I mean, especially if you want to bring in a guy like uh, Hall, you're going to need some cap room. So it might be better at that point to yeah. move on from him and get the room. Yeah. But we'll we'll discuss all that in the off season. Right now, we'll look ahead to August eighteenth, twentieth, and hopefully not the twenty second because I don't want this to go to seven. Yeah. Do I sound just? I will, do I sound really gloomy saying I wish that they just end this misery? Like, uh, no. It we've the problem is is that like these games didn't happen in a vacuum. We have like fifteen years of seeing basically this exact. Even under different teams, completely different rosters, we've seen the same story year in, year out, year in, year out. It's almost become the team's destiny. Yeah, and like even in the 90s, it was kind of the same thing. Well, and you're you're the guy every year that says in our predictions, these guys are going to make the Stanley Cup. And I think this year I finally said, you know what? They're not destined to go any further in the first round. Yeah, well, I, I always view things based on talent and talent should get you there but you know it, it i also view things as like the flames as a team do not have a lot of postseason experience and you know the lessons you learn you're supposed to learn from them instead we're seeing the exact same story and you know it's, I, I think you know and it's interesting you bring that up before we break for the day i think one of the things i was excited about coming into this whole new postseason the flames were talking the right way going into the jets series we're angry about last year we learned from last year we're going to do better like they were talking the talk and they delivered and now we're still hearing well we we want to be better than last year we want to learn from last year but they're not doing it and there's the thing i'm frustrated by is at some point i think the team needs to own we didn't play well tonight you know, and even when you listen to the coach, I mean, after tonight, he said this was probably the best game of the series, I think, for his team. Like, at some point, you have to say, guys, we didn't play well. Do better next time. No, and, like, I agree that, like, for the first 25-ish minutes, the Flames were playing absolutely awesome hockey. And then they stopped. Because, you know, clearly tying the game was all the difference. And, you know, that they could just give up at that point. Do you think and, they stopped, or do you think that Dallas just started playing better? Like, I, I, to me, I don't think the Flames stopped. I just think Dallas ramped up higher than the Flames did. Well, I don't I think, think the Flames that, were playing great. They were playing better than Dallas, but then then Dallas put on put on well, the gas. Well, you always have to expect the other team to push, but it's also not doing allowing and facilitating them being able to do that. And, like, if you're giving them lanes to cut into your zone or passing lanes or shooting lanes that shouldn't be there if you're doing things properly, then, you know, that's what where games get away from you. Because a team's going to push if they got time and space. And the Flames, after they got the Bennett goal, the first Bennett goal, they started giving Dallas way too much time and space and they ran with it. And okay, it's just the right. same same thing with Colorado last year. That They didn't respect the avalanche and they didn't make any adjustments. And then, oh, woe is me, we're getting absolutely creamed on the shot clock. Well, gee, if you're playing good defensively and just fundamentals and forcing them to beat you on plays, you know, because, like... Every time you have a confrontation with a player in the offensive zone, it's a 50-50 whether the guy's going to make the play or not. And if he doesn't, then you've created a turnover or a challenge for the puck, a battle on the boards or whatever. If you keep challenging them, eventually they'll turn it over. But the Flames just are content standing in their box and allowing Dallas to massage the openings to see if you know and that's when they start to run over you and when they're the flames are playing successful they're on them like that all the time and like in game one 
they never like in the third period they never gave dallas any time or space to actually get anything other than right comparing this to other games for sure but i don't think calgary played that much different in the first half of tonight's game game no for no it it was like when the 2-2 goal happened that they stopped i but that's what i'm saying i I don't know if they stopped or dallas just put on the gas yeah Calgary wasn't playing all that all that well to start with. They played better than Dallas, but I don't think they were playing a great game before that. Yeah. But, yeah, I don't know. We'll see what happens in the next game. Yeah. Um, if anybody wants to give us your thoughts on these games, uh, your thoughts on what the Flames should do in the offseason, if you think that there's any lineup moves that be, need to be made, or as Matt and I were talking about, what can the team do with the players we have? We can't make a trade right now, so how can we get better production out of the 20 guys the Calgary Flames are putting on the ice right now? Um, let us know. You can either phone us or text us. Our number's 587-200-7176. Again, 587-200-7176. Leave us a text. Leave us a voicemail. We'd love to play or read it on the show. Get a hold of us on Twitter. We're at Fireside Podcast or on Facebook. We're facebook.com slash Fireside Chat. We also have an Instagram where we're Fireside Chat underscore podcast. Um, You can get a hold of us there as well. So let us know. How do you think the Flames should change the lineup either now or in the offseason? What do they have to do to, to beat the Stars? And do you think it's better for them to go into round two and maybe not be able to win or just, you know what, fizzle out in round one and see what we can change for next year? We'd love to hear from all of you guys. Matt, any closing, any closing thoughts before we uh, get out of here? Even though it was doom and gloom, as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.